Hello and welcome to the first episode of Design Education Talks, the collaboration between the team here of the New Art School and the Design Podcast. Our guest today is Professor Phil Cleaver. Uh, so Phil, welcome. Welcome to the first episode of this, of this podcast. Thank you. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself. I've been designing for 40 odd years. I was trained by some of the biggest designers, uh, Garing, Alan Fletcher, Bob Gill. I was a protege of Anthony Foshard. And I worked with Michael Wolfe in the 80s at um, Wolfe Allen's. And then I was creative director of Allied International Designers during the late uh, and early 80s. Fantastic, fantastic. So, so this is a very long path. and. Uh, so tell us about, about this path and how this path has, has taken you here. I mean, this is a very long uh, you know, process and very long amount of time. Uh, so maybe we want to sort of go more in, into more detail or tell us about how your past experiences actually took you here. Well, I, start, I started in design because um, I basically, when I was about 15, my mum sat me down at the kitchen table with my dad and said, He's got a God-given art for getting into trouble, but he can only do two things. One was cooking, and the other was art. Um, he, my mum went, you can't, you can't go into cooking because you can hardly speak English, let alone French, because in that day and age, you had to speak French for um, working in, a, in a, as a chef. So my dad said, well, maybe if it's very tricky going into commercial art uh, because the chances of earning a living are very slim. And it was the only time I ever heard my mum swear. And she, she actually said, you could throw that little bastard in a sewer and you come out smelling of roses. And uh, my dad went, yeah, you're right. So I went to art school. And That's if it. you're only any good at one thing, uh, you just stay on the path and keep doing it. Yes, absolutely. And like other things in swimming pools, in the end, you float to the top. Absolutely. So... Uh... After art school, what, what, exact, what exactly happened then? Uh, I worked at Pentagram for Alan Fletcher's junior designer, and then I went to work for Vim Crow at Total Design in Holland uh, as a junior, again, as a, as a junior designer. Uh, I did a stint in New York, um, and then I started work, work, freelancing for myself, mainly doing music books for a company called Music Sales. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, our main topic today, uh, we're going to be focusing around the, the creativity and design thinking. So uh, do you find that this is something that the perception of has changed quite a bit over the years? Yes, I think the Part of the problem in education is most of the kids learn all the uh, programs, but they're not being trained in the same way with the craft skills or imagination skills. And the level of design is slightly superficial. It all looks very uh, good at a certain level, but the level seems to be at the level of whatever the Mac skills are. We seem to be producing thousands of what I call Mac monkeys, people that know all the programs but don't know how to think. Yes, well, we're going to have in-depth uh, uh, questions on, on education. Uh, absolutely. Uh, but what I'm saying is about, is about the, the uh, creativity design thinking as, as perceived also uh, by the industry or uh, as well, what, what, what that was uh, during you the seemed, Well, I was at a co conference in China and watched quite a few other um, well-known designers from America and Japan and everyone present, which is fascinating. But what was the outcome is there's a lot to do with systems and processes and very little evidence of that. The end results of fantastic graphic piece of communication. And I'm referring to branding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is that, has that changed today? Yeah, I think there's less cons, less creativity and this could be because of the whole point of can you actually sell what you produce or do you know how to produce amazingly creative ideas and get them through boards of directors mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if the advantage of being the next barrow boy in uh, london and growing up in the uh, 
streets of London is you learn to, you've got to sell what you produce. Otherwise, if you can't sell what you're producing, you're not really going to survive as a designer. So exactly. So how has that changed today? How has the perception of that creativity and selling what you're producing changed compared to when you started? In business? I think there was much more creativity and freedom um, and people were more, uh, I suppose people were more relaxed about having slightly uh, more images which are different. I mean, if you look at a lot of the major logos now, they're all basically beginning to look similar. Google uh, looks like Airbnb, which now looks like some of the others. They're all beginning to m merge together. And they're all becoming quite typographical, i.e. just the name uh, and very little in symbols. So this is the trend of minimalism? I think it's a trend of blandism. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Blandism is a word. <laughs> <laughs> so how can that, how can that trend uh, be overturned? Or how can also uh, design students um, improve this? What do they need to know in order for, for them to improve this? Well, I think, you know, if you're thinking about branding nowadays as a logo and some corporate colours and you stick the same thing on everything, you're, you're, you're thinking in the 19th and 20th century. Nowadays, it has to work on smartphones. It has to be able to work exceptionally fast and it's got to have a lot of different um, ways of operating. Mm -hmm. How do I, sorry, how do I stay online and stop the emails coming in? I can hear pings as the email comes in. I, so this uh, blandism, how, how can we reverse it as both as designers and help the design students to, to think about reversing blandism? I, th I think it's, uh, one thing is to start is for, for people to turn the computers off and actually think and start playing and cut bits of paper up and working in a creative way. If you, I'm not against the computer because they're very fantastic. They solve, they get rid of what was three or four systems. Um, but when you go in a library and you look at um, look at a subject and you want to, you want to look at different horses, you look for hundreds of books and for for a horse, and at the same time you see thousands of e irrelevant images, and it's looking in that system where you see all these different images which you don't need or don't want, um, which brings in things into the into your mind, which creates concepts and different ways of looking at things whereas if you just research on the on google you just get what you look at so if you put in the word horse you only ever see horses yes you don't see lots of art if you know go see well what how did picasso paint a horse you you do it because you're in art books you're in catalogues you're looking at different things and, and they start and bring things bring ideas together it's like a, you've got to feed the mind it's like a sponge so you're saying spend more time offline as well. So balance the offline and the online time. And yeah, the, yeah. I, I, I think, you know, you get ideas walking around street markets. You get ideas doing everything. You don't need to be staring at a computer. Absolutely. Absolutely. So tell us uh, how, uh, what are you doing and your creative endeavors, your creative endeavors now? Uh, what is it that you're doing now? I'm working... We're just finishing the branding of a bank uh, in Malaysia, and we're starting the visual analysis of a bank in Vietnam. Um, so I'm now traveling more into Vietnam, and we're working on a number of quite prestigious books for different photographers. And then we have ongoing things such as a book collector. So as busy as normal. So you also just finished your exhibition of a book object art. Yes, could everyone please buy it? Yes. Fantastic. It's available at impress hyphen publishing dot com. Um, yeah, it's it's a the book is a is a visual tour with very uh, little words. It's about over a hundred uh, of the folded books which are collaged. Um, and it it's uh, 
sums up that period of the last uh, four or five years of work in that field. So although I'm a commercial graphic designer, I'm also um, an author. I've done about four books now and I'm working on a couple more. And at the same time, um, I do, I'm a fine artist. So I have three strings to my bow. Fantastic. So where, where is that uh, art and the book going from here? I don't know yet. <laughs> it will go the way it goes. I, I don't think. I just work from the body. I design and do art and everything from the body, mm -hmm. from, from, from how I feel, not from using my head. If I use my head, I get awfully confused because I'm so dyslexic. Once I sort of try to use the brain, I, I know I've lost it. Absolutely. And, and it's just actually letting me en the energy you put into the work comes back. Brilliant. The energy comes from the body and the heart, not the head. So how did you, uh, all these experiences, uh, how did you get into, into teaching? Well, I think I gave my first lecture in Gritfield uh, uh, in Amsterdam uh, Art School in 1979. Because someone wanted, I was asked, could you show your work? Because it's very unusual, the typographic work. So that was my first lecture. Um, but most of my life, I've trained designers. I've always had juniors and interns. So I've spent a vast amount of my life training uh, people by nature of how I was trained by working with a, a more experienced designer. And therefore, education and talking about what I do is something I've naturally done over the years. It's just increased. Um, and then I was, I've been an external examiner and things. And then I was asked if I would be I was approached about becoming a professor um, because of all the experience and t time I've spent designing. So I just, I mean, I love, I love working with young people and so love working, teaching. I love um, the energy from, from all that. And it's a good place to begin to check, hopefully, give back to what's given me a long career yes of course of course of course and and this you've also we've also touched up upon this um, how to bring how you bring all this into the classroom so how is it that that you want to sort of help students today uh, with all your experience and and sort of fight the blandism uh well i think typography and a lot of graphics is a trainable system in the same way that you become a craftsman um, and learn a trade. And I think graphic design is a trade. Um, it's not an art. You're not an artist. You're, you're a tradesperson. You shouldn't, it shouldn't be your stamp on the work. You should be the thing where a client has a problem. You are the vehicle which can absorb what he wants to do and visualize it. So it comes out looking exactly like the answer to his brief, not, this looks like yet yeah, another one of Phil Cleaver's design jobs. So I try, so you are, you're, the, you're the thing in the middle which translates the problem and solves it to give a solution. It's just communication. But it's not about you personally. It's like designing a book. If you look at a fantastic book, you should be able to pick it up, look at the book, enjoy it, put it down, and don't even realize it's not being, it's not being designed. So you want to help students create an, an impersonal approach at the, well, at the same time having a personal approach to yeah to I think I think there's two, there's two things and I think also teaching you know typography is not taught in the same way anymore I mean when I started you your work you had to hand draw the type you had to mark it up in a language the compositors would understand and then it went off to a compositor and he typeset it and it mm -hmm. came back uh, as repro for you to lick and stick down, or it was printed completely letterpress. Mm -hmm. It was a completely different world. But do you think that there's? You said that it's a trainable. It's, it's trainable, of course. But do you think that needs to be an initial ability? Uh, and and how can somebody know that they have that initial ability? Like, if you don't like doing the arts, you'd be mad to go into it. Mm -hmm. I do think you have to. You have to spend your life doing what you enjoy doing. And if you don't enjoy doing the arts, it's not the right profession to go into because 
you, your chances of success are, 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 not, are very slim. Mm -hmm. You have to have a degree of artistic talent. Um, and, and do you find now that uh, this is recognized or do you find that this is sort of people are coming in more, uh, more blindly into this or, or more sort of less knowing, even though we have more information? You find to a certain extent, if you get rid of art and graphics in secondary schools and you start getting rid of it at A level, then we're going to have less experience when they come into um, onto degree courses. And, and also the hand and eye movement you learn from drawing type or working with pencils in the old ways gave you, trained your eyes so you could spot when things were wrong immediately. Um, which you tend not to get nowadays because the, um, it's, not, it's not taught in the same way in schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how do you see uh, all this sort of situation today uh, becoming also becoming a career for designers? Turning into a career. What do you mean? Into, because there's so many facets of design. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, a moving image and everything to do with that is going to become a moving and sound and putting them together is going to become basically much more important than it has uh, previously. It's the whole experience of a brand, not just what it looks like. So students and prospective students need to be kind of focusing more on uh, the brand experience and, and, and motion, correct? I think students need to actually stop worrying about being designers, relax and play. Because mm -hmm. when they play, when you play, you produce more creativity. And, and don't worry about being a designer, just worry about solving the problem and what's the best way of playing to get a fantastic solution. Yes, yeah, so more, more, more play. as in More play. Yes. Of yeah, course. definitely more play. It's, got to be, it's fun. It's a fun way, fun thing to be doing. Course. And experiment and do things. If you don't experiment, if you don't make mistakes, you'll never get anything right. Absolutely, absolutely. So, with all with all the experience in design education, how 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 uh, can we do today design education differently? What would you add, replace, or remove? I. I mean, one of the interesting things about going backwards to go forwards is if you can actually uh, learn, learn the hand and eye skills uh, early on, it stands you in good stead as you go forward, even if you never draw again, or you draw type or how you use things. And also that, the thing of actually understanding visual language everything's got a visual language. You've just got to understand it. And once you can understand it, you can manipulate it. And then you can put two, two things which have never been connected together. Um, but a great, I, th I think you, you would need a much, I think you need a diverse sector. I mean, one of the advantages at art school is by the time they get to third year, they've tried loads of things. Um, but I think a year in industry is also a very good idea because mm -hmm. you, you learn a set of skills um, which are great for you to use in your last year at art school. But you also learn that the third year is probably the last time you'll ever be able to create anything the way you want for at least a few years. Um, and that's building a portfolio which represents you and is about you, uh, which gives, gives the chance to actually excel in what you want to become. Whereas without that year in industry or nine months in industry, you still don't really know what you're walking into. Absolutely. So you're talking about apprenticeships and, and, and would you say that right now it's more of the responsibility of students to, be, to, to, to uh, ensure that they have an apprenticeship because, because it's also becoming increasingly tricky? Yeah, I think it's apprenticeships in turn, in turn I mean, you've got internships that work well, but I think you're better doing the internships when you're a student. But how would you advise a student to go about finding one? Because, because also many of the doors are more closed uh, today. I, don't, I think part of this is, is a myth. I mean, 
for, for all the doors in design have always been closed. Um, you just got to learn how to kick them down. Mm-hmm. Um, that's quite funny because I said kick the door down. Someone's hammering on the door downstairs. Um, but it's never been easy to get a job in the design world. Um, and you've got to kick on a lot of doors. You've got to work out. I mean, you've been, by the time you left art school, you've been trained on how to look at a problem, solve a problem, and work on a problem. This is just yet another example of how to take that understanding and do it for yourself. So would you say perseverance would be something that uh, is... Oh, you have, to be, you have to be a complete optimist to be a designer. Uh, it's always the next job I'm interested in. Uh, you know, and it's... <laughs> Making money has never been, never been the reason I became a designer or an artist. It's it's the byproduct of being very good at what you do, not the reason we get out of bed in the morning. I get out of my bed in the morning because I want to solve some amazingly tricky problem, or I want to design something, which that's what floats my boat. So um, you're saying that to focus more on the enjoyment of being a designer rather than the, than, than the financial reward. Oh yeah, because I think if you're happy within yourself and you're doing what you love, then um, that's actually worth a lot more than uh, a large amount of money. But the art, being doing what you doing what you want to do, obviously, is a lot trickier than doing what you're paid to do. But also, the, the, one needs to be able to understand that 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 with that kind of great freedom comes also great responsibility in a way that. Uh, the, do they, how do we make them aware of the kind of responsibility that that kind of freedom comes with? By training them properly. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's also the history of graphics isn't very old. I mean, it doesn't take a long to learn how everyone else has tackled similar problems from when you're getting. Uh, but no one seems to actually study um, the history of design. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it will give you any ideas, but what it does do is it's fantastic to watch and not all or how everyone else does things. I still read every design magazine I can find and look at whatever's been created. I, I'm just as fascinated by watching, looking at other design companies' work as I've always been. It's now easier because it's all on the web. You can see it all on the web. Absolutely. Fantastic. So uh, what advice would you like to leave us with um, in, in conclusion and sort of for, for both for students and for sort of advice for design educators? For students, well, uh, I, I think typography needs to be, if a compositor had seven years training to set type and to learn his trade, I don't think type, the basics of producing really good typographers is inherently trained in art schools to take out that um, the fact that we've absorbed that profession mm-hmm. um, and the knowledge of print is is less and if you pick up a book from you pick up pick up an antique book on the whole it's very well typeset and produced and, and a lot of that standard is disappearing and I think books are becoming art objects and mm-hmm. I think now we have to design books which not only just give you the information, but are actually fascinating three-dimensional objects in their own right. Okay. And also you can always fold them up afterwards if you don't like them. <laughs> oh, fantastic. And, coll- and collage them with all the stuff you've collected over 40 years as a designer. <laughs> so for students, you're, you're, you're saying treat more design as sort of look into art, look into your, the craft uh, and enjoy. So for students, this is, this is your, would be your advice. Yeah, and even if you're stuck doing a boring job, continue doing your own design work. Absolutely, and for for art educators and for sort of the future of design education, I think it's art schools have always survived on having external living working designers come in, um, and I think that's very very important. Mm-hmm. And I also think if most designers, which can get a PhD, probably can't design very well. Because the two <laughs> things on the whole don't go together. Absolutely. So focus less on, on, on the theory and more on the craft. 
Yes. I mean, the fact you need to train your visual side of your life, not the writing side, although writing is awfully important, but it's just another visual, it's just another communication or expression of communication. Superb, superb. So where can we find more about you? Where, where can one find more information about you? I'm good at hiding. Okay. Um, there's an et al website and there's which a is, art which, website. What is, what is the URL of that? Uh, the fact we haven't looked at it in 10 years, it doesn't okay. say, it just says everything, doesn't it? Uh, et al-design.com. Okay. Uh, my art books are under, uh, Phil, um, under philcleaver.com. And the, a lot, quite a lot of the print work is under impress-publishing.com. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you ever so much for a very insightful. It's a ple and, pl pleasure. Uh, and uh, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.